There we go. Okay, folks. Um, here, I'm going to share my screen just a moment. Here, just a sec. Okay, so my name is Don Wedding, and please feel free to call me Don if you wish. Um, so I'm very informal, uh, but I answer to pretty much anything. I'm married, so my wife calls me a lot worse than Don. Um, but anyways, today is uh, June 19, the year 2007, and this is Predict 411, and this is our introductory SYNC session, and we're just going to talk about how you can go through um, Predict 411 and uh, come out the other end with a nice grade and having learned a lot of stuff. So this is just going to be a quick acclimation for the class. How about that? And before we get started, let me just quickly uh, take a look at the chat window. Does anybody have any questions? I know that uh, I believe it was Roger had a, a Robert Grant had a question, um, and I was going to I'll address that one when when we start talking about the assignment. He was asking about Enterprise Miner, but does anybody have any questions about the class itself before we get started? Um, if not, we're just going to walk through the class shell real fast and the various parts of the class. I'm looking at the chat window and I'm not seeing anything. Do I hear somebody about to ask a question? And please do not be shy. Mm. Okay. So let's get started. Um, so anyway, this class is Predict 411. And let me bring up the class shell here. And mm, so here is the class shell. I, I'm teaching two different sections of 411, but I usually just merge the two classes together for the sync session. Sometimes the, the sync sessions are on Monday, sometimes Tuesday, sometimes. It depends on really, I try to have a couple of sync sessions throughout the quarter, and I do travel for a living. I work as the director of data science for Sprint, and they have me flying in and out of Kansas a lot. So when my schedule permits, I can't tell you ahead of time. It usually takes me about a week or two ahead of time before I know when I can do a sync session. So um, I'm never quite sure what day of the week they'll be on. Um, so this is the, the class that we have here, or this is the class shell itself. And let's go through some of the, um, you know, like the syllabus and some of the requirements for the class. How about that? Um, the first thing that you want to notice is that the class is really broken down into three sections. The first section is going to be... Um, right here, this will be unit one, and this will be from weeks one to three, and it's going to be on linear regression. And I understand you guys all just finished predict 410, and you guys did linear regression. However, you didn't do it my way, okay? You learned all that theory, and now what's going to happen is I'm going to give it to you with a real data set, and this data set's got missing values and outliers and all sorts of other stuff going on with it. Um, and I'm going to teach you guys really a more practical approach to building models. And I'm not certain if you guys are um, probably have heard about my approach to analytics, but basically it goes like this. Um, statistics is to predictive modeling, which is what we're doing in this class. So statistics is to predictive modeling as boxing is to a back alley street brawl, okay? So I'm going to turn you guys into a bunch of analytic street brawlers. In a back alley street fight, the goal here is to win, okay? For a predictive modeling, what's your goal here is you want to build a model that is making you money. So the model, and people always say, well, how do I know if my model is any good? My answer is if it makes sense and it makes money, it's right, okay? You can always make it better later on. But if you're, whatever you're doing, if it's better than what you're doing now and you're making money on it and the model's making sense, then it's a good model. So we're going to learn this. So we're going to start with, with linear regression and we're going to do the money ball problem. And that's our first homework and it's going to be due in three weeks. And we will have a sync session probably next week sometime towards the end of the week where I will answer questions. I recommend you guys get started on the homework 
right now. If you wait until like the weekend before it's due, you're going to be really regretting that decision. Okay. So the first three weeks are linear regression. This next th uh, four to six weeks is logistic regression. Then we do Poisson regression. So these are going to be three types of generalized linear models. And while you learn these three types, there's many, many types of generalized linear models. These are the three big ones. Linear and logistic will account for about 99% of what you do in the real world. And of the last 1%, Poisson will probably be about 90% of that last 1%. But once you understand what a generalized linear model is, you'll be able to handle like gamma distribution and Tweety and all those other types of, of um, you'll understand the principle. Um, the last week of the quarter is survival analysis, and it just gives you a very quick overview on it. There's not enough time to give you a meaningful assignment on this, but it gives you a very quick overview of this. And it doesn't really belong in this class. Survival analysis is not really a generalized linear model but I just wanted to touch on the topic so that you can become familiar with it so when you see it later on. We had an extra week, so I thought that's why it's going in there. Um, so let's talk about the class itself. Now let's come up here. First, what you're gonna wanna do is familiarize yourself with the class shell, okay? Um, coming down here, we see that um, the downloads. Okay, the first thing here is the syllabus. Let's take a real quick look at the syllabus. So I'm going to click on this guy. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time that you guys are, have a question. Okay, so let's look at the syllabus. And this is me. And again, Donald Keith Wedding, PhD, but call me Don if you feel like it, or if you don't feel comfortable, I answer to, Don, to, to Professor Wedding or anything else you want to call me. Okay, this is my email for Northwestern, and this is my personal email. When I'm on the road, it sometimes is difficult for me to get to my Northwestern email. I highly recommend you send your email to both Donald Wedding, Northwestern, and D Wedding at ACM. Send it to both of them, okay? Um, this is the number, this is my home office that I'm talking to you from right now, and this is my cell phone number right here. When I'm on the road, this is the number you're gonna wanna get me at. How would I like to be communicated? My preference would be post something to the discussion board if you can. That, the nice thing about that is I can answer it and then I've answered it for everybody because many people have the same question that you do. I have never had anybody give me, and I've been teaching here since 2013, I've never had a stupid question, okay? Every question you think, and you're like, oh my gosh, I, I, I think this is a dumb question, and you're afraid to ask it, I guarantee you 90% of the students in the class are wondering the exact same thing, and everyone's afraid to ask. The only bad question is the one you don't ask. Ask them, okay? I would prefer it on the discussion board. However, sometimes you need instantaneous turnaround, okay? So, Send me an email. I may not get it back to you immediately because, like I say, I'm on the road and sometimes I'm either in an airport or I'm in a meeting and I can't get back to you, but I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. You may also call me at my home number when I'm in town. Call me on my cell phone. People say, when can I call you? My answer is, you call me whenever you need to talk with me. Now, People say, well, can I call you Sunday night? You know, I, I, I would prefer that you didn't call me at Sunday night at 3 in the morning. You know, if, if, but if it's an emergency, do it. And people say, well, what's an emergency? And my answer is always the same. If it's important to you, it is important to me. So I will answer the phone call. If I answer it, I will never yell at you. If I don't answer it, it's probably because I'm sleeping through your call because I sleep pretty hard. But... Um, you know, please try not to call me at 3 a.m. on a Sunday. But like I said, if if it's that important, I will. If I answer it, I'll be as happy as can be to talk to you. So that's you know that's the answer to the question. You call me when you need to, and I will try to help you. Okay. Um, let's take a quick look. This is the textbook that we're using, John P. Hoffman, Generalized Linear Models. You're going to notice that there's about 18 different versions of this book floating around. In reality, there's only one. The bookstore sells a version because the books, uh, um, 
Pearson Education said if we created a customized version of this textbook, they would give you guys a discount. I go, well, what's customized? They said any kind of input from the professor makes it customized. Okay, so I threw my syllabus in as the very last page, and now it's the exact same book, only it's got my syllabus in at the very end. And because of that, you can get a discount. That's all I did. So, but if you find this book anywhere, you, it's going to be the same exact book. Now, some people don't even buy the book, and you can just get by on the notes for the class. Um, however, I don't recommend this. I, I specifically chose this book because I think it's a very nice, um, a happy medium between something that's so theoretical that it's unusable and something that's so simple and romper room level that you can't use it. This is a nice middle of the road thing. It's not a perfect book, but it was the best I could find. And I actually think it's a pretty decent book. Um, a lot of the students actually like it. So it might be worth getting it, but I do have students who don't buy the book and they then they can live with it. Um, I'm a big fan of the Little Book of Sass by Delwich and Slaughter. What I would recommend Get this on eBay and get like, you know, the first or second edition on eBay for like $5. It's going to be, it's a great book to have. And if you get the latest and greatest. Somebody might want to put themselves on mute there. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a book is worth having. Um, but, you know, it's one I would recommend. Um, software, we're going to use, um, we use uh, SAS for this class. So I would, re um, now some people say, well, I have access to SAS at work or something else. Any version of SAS should work for you. However, I do recommend you setting up the SAS on demand for academics, like the, the instructions say, because you would have access to SAS Enterprise Minor, which is actually a very powerful tool, and I'll give you bonus points for that. Incidentally, I will, even though this course is taught in SAS, if you do anything in R or Python or Angus or any other languages, I've had students do stuff with Microsoft, with IBM Watson, or if you read, you know, so if you, if you do anything with another language, I will, and you highlight it, I will give you bonus points for this. The nice thing about this is if you do it, like let's say you do something in R for homework number one. Well, now you know how to do R. So for homework number two and homework number three, you can continuously just redo you know, the, the assignments in, in the language that you've already learned, and you can just keep raking in the bonus points. So it's worth it. This is a class that you will get out of it exactly what you put into it. I have students, um, you need 930 points to get an A in this class. OK, so there's but I have had students by week seven or week eight, they've had like sixteen hundred points because they've done so much bonus work and they've just they love the class. I also have had students who are like, you know, week 10 and there's still like, you know, one day to go and they, they're still far away from passing the course because they've done no bonus work. They have phoned it in on their homework assignments. You know, I, I get all ranges in this. It's the students that throw themselves into this class. Those are the ones who will love this class. They will learn to build predictive models in a real world setting, and they will learn a lot. Throw yourself into this class and really enjoy it. Um, so let's see here. Um, so in theory, 750 points for the projects. I have 250 points possible. Uh, for quizzes, I do have more than 250 points. So in theory, you can, you know, those extra points would just be bonus points if you can get them. You don't have to do any bonus points. You can get an A just doing the bare minimum in this class. However, I recommend doing the bonus points. There's lots of bonus work here. Um, let's okay. see here. Any questions so far? Nope. Okay. This is the grading scale. Now, given that we have so many bonus points available, this is the grade you're going to get. So if you have 929 points at the end of the quarter, guess what grade you're going to get? You're going to get an A-. minus. This is the grade you are going to get. You get 699 points, you're going to get an F. Because 
there's so much opportunity to improve your grade that um, if you miss it, then I don't give it to you. I, I, you will, I promise you, you will get the grade that you deserve. So these are, this is the grading scale right here. Um, let's see. Uh, these are the policies for attendance, and you know, basically, this is a, a an asynchronous class. So really, you log in as you need to. But um, the people I've in the past have learned that the more you log into the class, the more you're going to get out of this stuff. Um, you know, I understand that life happens. If something is coming up, please let me know as far enough in advance as possible, and I can maybe give you an extension on the homework. It's when the people start calling me at Sunday at 11 o'clock that, that it's, it gets me a little uneasy. It's when they call me a week ahead of time and say, hey, listen, you know, I'm, um, they're sending me on a business trip to London. Can I have a couple of extra days? I'm usually pretty flexible. I understand that life happens. So please give me as much of a lead time as possible. Um, I can be flexible if you can be, you know, work with me on this stuff. Um, so everything is due on a Sunday night at midnight, and um, you know these are the start weeks and the stop weeks. So that this is just the time there for these things. Um, and that's kind of it about the the everything you need to know about the syllabus. Does anybody have any very quick questions about that? And we'll move on to some other things. I'm hearing silence uh, in the class. I, somebody a, give me a question. There's a chat question. There's a chat question. If we do something in R or in another language, do we also need to do it in SAS? Yes, you do. This class has to be taught in SAS. You can't say, oh, I know R already and just do it in R. If you know R, that's great. You can rack up some bonus points. Um, and it's not a trivial amount of bonus points. It, they, they can really start adding up. Do it in SAS, and incidentally, trust me on this when I tell you this. R and Python might be the future, but SAS is the now, okay? Um, every one of the Fortune 500 companies has a huge SAS presence. Not all of them are using R. R is open. There's a lot of... Can someone put themselves on mute? Thanks. Okay. Nope, no final exam, Curtis. Um, so, make noise just a sec. Um, okay, so the punch. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. I muted myself. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so anyways, the, the punchline to the, the story is that um, learn SAS. It's going to be in your best interest. And then do something in R. And if you are an R expert, push yourself. Grab yourself the free bonus points, okay? I got no problem with that. More practice, the better. Besides, if you do the same problem in SAS and then do it in R, you learn where, where SAS is great and R is horrible, and you learn where R is great and SAS is horrible. You learn the strengths of both languages, but don't stop there. I mean, I'm giving you access to like tools like Angos and, and Salford Systems, and I had students go out there and use um, IBM Watson and Microsoft Azure, you know, there's so much out there. Just throw yourself into this stuff and, and try other languages, okay? So, anyways, um, other questions? As well. Oh, wait, I take that back, Curtis. There is a final exam. I forgot. I have a final exam. But if you pay attention in the class, there's no way you could study for it. It's just 18 questions, and the questions are basically, um, you know, as you go through the quarter, you'll understand, you, you'll be, you'll, do fine on the final exam if you've paid attention in the class, okay? That's all I'll say for it right now. Um, so anyways, let's see, let's go back to the, um, to the discussion board now.
Um, mm -mm -mm. So let's talk a little bit more of some things. Okay, so you'll also notice if we move down a little bit more, um, here's the template for the project right up here. And let me pull this guy up. And every quarter, the students get, you know, they don't listen to me, but I'm gonna tell you again. Um, you gotta follow this template and understand what I'm saying. Um, I want you to write this assignment as though you were writing a report to your boss, okay? So it's gotta be understandable at a level of like a CEO level. This guy is smart, but he doesn't know a lot about statistics. You have to put just enough statistics in there that he is he can understand what you're telling him and that he's confident that you've done all of your research, okay? You can't just say, the guy who hits the most home runs is gonna make us the most money, okay? You can't do that. You have to say, here, here's some analysis that I did to show you why that's the case. You don't have to crawl into the weeds, just give him enough that he understands and has confidence. He's about to invest $100 million in Reggie Jackson. He wants to know, if he should do it or not, you know? So you're gonna have to make sure that you are thorough and you're complete in your explanation because this guy wants to know that you did a good job before he, before he writes a check for $100 million. Um, so you're gonna write this thing so that it is um, understandable by these, by like your boss's boss. You want it to be understandable high level. Okay, these are the do's and don'ts. Like, for example, I want PDF format. Why? Because if you put your reports in Microsoft Word, it's like wearing tennis shoes to a job interview. It's unprofessional, okay? Um, when you hand in, when you, I don't want you to just dump all of your SAS output into your PDF document and say, here, figure it out, boss. It doesn't work that way. What I want you to do is take your output from SAS and find one or two parts of this that you think are important and describe them and put them in there. Don't give me a bunch of output. Be very, um, you know, exercise editing skills, okay? I want you to, dis and then whenever you put in there, just thoroughly discuss it. Let me give you an example. Oh, I want an introduction. Okay, this is a bad introduction. The purpose is to analyze baseball data. A good introduction is something like this. Use these as templates or understanding of what I'm looking for. Your results, what I want you to do is edit down to the bare minimum of what you should include and then put a lot of effort into discussing it. For example, Here's a diagram of error distributions, okay? And so this is a bad description. I examine the output and there's no pattern. Well, this is a good way of describing that same thing. You can see I've put about you know, a paragraph describing this thing. Now, incidentally, people are saying, do I have to worry about my error distributions? And my answer to that is, that's what I'm paying you to tell me. If I'm George Steinbrenner, he probably doesn't know what analyzing error distributions are. Personally, I never, in my real world job, I never look at error distributions. If there's a pattern in my errors, what that usually means is that I've built a model and if I find a pattern in my error, it means that there's still something that I haven't accounted for. I'm still making money with this thing and, it, and if, there's a, if there's a pattern in your error, then that's a, a, a signal that maybe you can go back at a later date and make the model even better. But you know what? If there's a pattern in your error, it's not fatal. So the point is, I personally don't care much about that, but some people do. You guys might want to put it in there. I don't, but I don't care. You guys, have, I want you to exercise judgment when you're writing your reports, okay? Now, here's something else. When you give me a final... Um, equation when you build your predictive model. Now, incidentally, I used random numbers here, okay? So, so don't expect your formula to look like this. It's not going to. But 
let's say that for the baseball assignment, this is the mathematical regression formula that I get. Well, you'll notice that like X1 happens to be base hits and X2 is home runs. So I write about this thing and I say, well, look, the team that hits the most base hits and the most home runs wins the more games because look, you know, they, they've got a positive sign in front of it. And if you strike out a lot, whoops, you lose more games because there's a minus sign in front of that. So you talk about that. Now, incidentally, look over here. Um, hits into double plays, okay? That's a bad thing. That means I hit the ball and it goes to somebody and then he gets two out. Okay, that's a bad thing. But look at this. There's a positive sign in front of that. That means that I'm rewarding you for doing something bad. Sometimes when you build a predictive model, you get something that's a counterintuitive result. If that happens, you usually try to get it the heck out of the model, okay, if you do your best. But sometimes it just doesn't want to leave, okay? It's like a, a bad house guess. It doesn't want to go anywhere. It just keeps... Your model gets really bad when it's gone. Well, if that's the case, then what you're going to want to do is talk about it. Say, hey, by the way, because remember, your boss is George Steinbrenner of the Yankees, and he's going to fire you if you don't tell him this. If, if he notices this, then he's going to think you don't know what the heck you're doing. So take a look at this. The only point of concern is with the variable hits into double plays. This value is positive and you know, in other words, if there's something that doesn't make sense, you talk about it, okay? Now, here's a bad thing. Um, there's the same thing here, only now I'm doing X1, X2. I don't even say what they are. And then I don't even, this is the formula I chose. This would be a bad description of your model. You notice I'm not talking about anything, okay? Then conclusion, this is a bad conclusion. I built some models and they were good and I learned a lot. Okay, that's, here's something good. This is a better thing. So I want you to put some thought into your, um, your model. Another thing is I give bonus points. So I love it when students use decision trees. I love it when students try other languages. If you do any bonus work, what I want you to do is put it either listed at the very beginning. I love it in the beginning because then I know what to look for. List what you did and list how many points you think it's worth. Sometimes I give you more than you ask. Sometimes I give you less than you ask, but I want to know the order of magnitude. If you're, if you're thinking you did 20 points worth of R coding and you've only got one line there and I'm looking all over your program for where, where's 20 points worth here, that doesn't make me real happy, okay? I prefer if you give me a, an idea of what I'm looking for. Estimate what you think it's worth so I know what I'm looking for. Um, if you don't tell me about the bonus points and I don't see it, you don't get it. And um, as they say with bingo bonus points, all sales are final. So, you know, I, I don't have time to go back there and give you more points. So please list them for me. So. This is a real quick uh, overview of the project template. And what I usually do is for the first homework, what I will do, well, heck, maybe I'll do it right now. Um, mm -mm. I'll just show you what some good assignments are. I'll post some good assignments towards the you know, end of week two, just so you get an idea of what we're looking for. But let's see here, one sec. Um, Archives, no, that's not it, I'm sorry. Here we go. So here's some students who've let me use their work from the past. I'll give you some, I, some really good ones that I've had. And every now and then I might say, hey, listen, can I have a copy of your homework assignment to show future students. So here's some guy um, from one of my past courses. Look, he, he's Jonathan Lesko, and you can see he tells me what his bonus points were, what he thinks they were worth. Um, 
and then coming down here, you can see he's, well, he gave me 85 pages. I don't know if you necessarily have to do that much work, but this was an amazing report. And he really put a lot of work into discussing everything. So this guy put a lot of work into this thing. Maybe 85 pages might have been overkill, but I want to show you some of, um, you know, what an amazing report looks like. Because remember, this is going to your boss. Your boss, anybody can build a predictive model. But a true data scientist is a guy who can discuss a good predictive model. But it, you can also exercise some creativity. Like, look at this guy, Russ Conte here. Um, he, put, he made this almost like a, a report for investors. You know, so he, he put, you know, colorful pictures and, and, you know, he put a lot of creativity in this. So you're not, it, it doesn't have to be sterile and, and you know, um, very academic. You can make this, he made his like it was a report to investors and it was really nice. So this is, you know, again, something you can do. Um, let's just see a look at some of the other ones here. Um, I don't know what Belinda. Yeah, see, hers is only 23 pages, so you can you can do this thing in a smaller, uh, a, a much smaller list, or a smaller size. But anyways, this is you know these are some examples of of good reports. So let me cut back here and see if anybody. Um, 85 pages is kind of a long to, for a CEO. Yes, that is correct, Francisco. That is a lot. And I probably, I think I wrote a letter to the guy and said, hey, listen, you probably don't ever want to do that in the real life. But you see here, Francisco, that some, the other students did it like in 20 pages or less. So you don't have to do 85. I'm just showing you that some students really uh, go overboard on this stuff. And I want you to, you know, I get students who hand in like four pages and all it is is SAS output and nothing. And I had one student last quarter and they got like, or two quarters ago and I gave them a 30 out of 150. And they said, uh, well, Don, why did you give me a 30? And I said, because I don't have the heart to give you what you deserved. So, um, you know, that's, uh, Put something into these things because it's not just these are not it's not designed to be busy work. It's really for your own benefit. Um, let's go back here real fast. Um, we'll do a few more things here. Um, okay. So um, let's see. Oh, we'll talk about Kaggle in just one moment. Um, Okay, somebody asked about Enterprise Miner. Somebody said, uh, asked before the, we started doing the, um, the sync session, somebody said, can you do the whole thing in Enterprise Miner? The answer is, I want you to write code. The reason why is Enterprise Miner is a powerful tool, but I worked for SAS for 10 years and I was their go-to guy. Whoever, somebody might want to put themselves on you. Okay. Um, so I worked for SAS for 10 years, and I was their, their um, analytics person for Enterprise Miner. So I would go around the country working with people and doing proof of concept work with Enterprise Miner. It's a great tool, okay? However, it doesn't do everything. Eventually, you're going to have to hop into code. Enterprise Miner by itself is, is fine, but when you know the code underneath it, you can really make that tool sing. So you've got to know some code. So um, I will give you bonus points for using Enterprise Miner and trying all sorts of great stuff with it, but you still have to do most of your work in code. You can let Enterprise Miner generate your score code for you if you want. Um, so let's uh, let's think of other things here. Um, mm -mm. Let's see, I've got some other stuff in here, and th these are just little things that over the time, like for example, I had a student in one of my Predict 498 classes did a little white paper, a how-to, how do you integrate R and Tableau? And I said, well, this is great, and she let me use it, and I put it here. If you ever wanna know how to do that, do it, 
and I might give you bonus points. Plus, it's a great skill that you can use the rest of your life. Um, one of our TAs, Raymond Anden, went and got his SAS certification, and that's a very legitimate, that's a powerful certification, and it carries a lot of weight in industry, and it's hard, and it took Raymond like two or three times to get it, and I don't have mine. I mean, that's a hard uh, test to pass. He wrote reflections on it on how to prepare for it, so that might be doing it. I had one of my former students was also a a headhunter or recruiter, so he did an example of a resume of a person who graduated here so that you can maybe use this as a template. So students have given me stuff over the years, and I just, if, if I find it to be interesting, I put it here. This is always worth looking at, okay? Um, sync sessions. What I do is whenever there's a sync session, I save it. I record it and I save it. So for example, if you click on this guy here, OLS regression, this was my sync session from 2015. And you'll notice that a lot of this stuff occurs over and over again. I mean, how, how many different ways can you solve the baseball problem? Well, what I'll do is I'll take this guy and I'll solve it for you. It won't be a good model, but I'll actually write code and I'll show you how I would approach the problem. And I even go and I give you, like this guy right here, I even gave you the SAS code that I wrote so you can watch how I wrote it, and here's some SAS code that I did. This is not a good model, but you can, if nothing else, play monkey see, monkey do with this code, and you can use that. But after a while, it starts being the same. So you guys can start watching this right now and, and get something out of it. So what I started doing last quarter was I started solving the same thing with Enterprise Miner. So I said, okay, SAS Enterprise Miner, how would I solve the baseball problem with that? So there you go. So I've given, this is yet another, um, these are sync sessions worth watching. Um, and I do that for every single one of these. I've got lots of stuff. I've got sample code for you to look at. This way you don't have to wait two weeks for me to do a office hours. You can do it now. Um, somebody has, has a chat message question. Let me see. Um, the question that they asked was, do you have an R code example for Moneyball? No, I don't have one of those yet, but if I can get a student to do it from beginning to end in a very um, turnkey fashion, I might post that. I, I've done um, examples of using Rattle the R package rattle, but I've never written one up in R from beginning to end because it's just, it's not something I can easily do in an hour or two. Um, R is a nice language, but it's not necessarily um, conducive for, for something like this. Um, but uh, let's see here, let me go back to, mm -mm -mm. Okay, one minute. Let me get back to where I was at. Here we go. So I've got uh, the template. Oh, oh, oh. Everybody in this class, you might want to read this thing on the p-value. Okay? This is in the download. There's a really great article about the p-statistic that, that you learn in, in uh, analytics. This is really worth reading. It will change your life because you're going to realize a lot of these statistical tests that you do look great in a textbook, but in the real world, they don't always work so well. Same thing with, you know, has anybody seen that the uh, bingo bonus for the adjusted R squared? That's a quick 10 points, and it will change your life because you're going to realize that the adjusted R squared is not necessarily going to be um, uh, the the best indicator of whether or not your model is any good. But I'm just trying to show you some of the, the stuff that we have out here. Um, let's see what else we have. Oh, here's something else you're going to want to do. So here's general information. Let's scroll down a little bit. Um, material from former students. Um, where the heck, what is that? Oh, 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 okay, I'm sorry. J 
general information. We scroll down a little bit, downloads, message in a bottle. These are messages to you from former students. So they on your last day here, you get to write a message. Sometimes they write something funny. They put a comic strip in there. They put their mother's grape jelly recipe in there. Who knows? But a lot of them will give you advice on how to get an A in this class or what they learned. It's worth looking at these things. So um, that's something else to look at. Um, let's see. Show and tell. What's that? My Predict 498 class, that's the capstone class. What they do is once a quarter, I have a thing called show and tell, and everybody has like the Predict 498 students get 10 minutes to talk about a topic. It could be anything. Um, I've had students talk about uh, little known tricks for using Microsoft Excel. I've had students talk about um, uh, Hadoop or you know, Hive or all sorts of stuff. You know, these are worth watching. So I've got a bunch of, and they're all about 10 minutes long, and, and you know, I record them. And they're, it's just a very quick way to get some, some information um, on some topic. Uh, also, I've had my Predict 498 capstone students. If you ever want to see what a final capstone class looks like, that's it. And also, a bunch of Enterprise Minor videos. I solved all of the assignments last quarter in Enterprise Minor, and I've got them recorded here. So if you want to see how to solve them in Enterprise Minor, this is it. So these are worth watching for that purpose. Um, let's see. And then we're almost done here. Um, these are the discussion boards here, cafe questions and answers, et cetera. Um, mm -mm -mm. Let's go down a little bit further if there's anything else. I think that's it. That's, that's the whole class itself. Let me show you one other thing here. When you do a homework assignment, you build your predictive model, and then what you do is you go out to Kaggle. Kaggle is a, is a website where they hold competitions and, and companies will put data out there and you can model their data and then they'll say, okay, now here's a new data set, score this and tell us um, which companies are gonna buy you know, Twinkies. And so you'll build this model and you'll predict Twinkie consumption and the guy with the best Twinkie model will win like $1,000. But then he has to tell the Twinkie company what he did. So these are, it's called Kegel. And that's what we're going to use to build our models this quarter. So you're going to build the models, and then you're going to upload your models to Kegel. And I'll show you how that's done. So you'll notice that I send out early on links. So links to the Kegel competition. So I send them out to you. And in this case, we have two. We have the insurance, which is bingo bonus, and we have Moneyball. Okay, so if you want to, um, you take this link, and I get students like on Sunday night, the day this is due, they're like, hey, Don, um, I can't submit it. Well, the reason why you can't submit anything is because you haven't registered. And the way you register is you click on this link. So you click on the Moneyball link. And we wait, and we wait some more. And of course, it goes really slow when, when. Uh... There we go. So now what I've done is I've just registered, and you say I'm going to make a submission, and it says these are the rules. Do I accept the rules? And you say yes, I do. And you say, yes, I do, and we wait. So this thing is, of course, uh, hey, Kimberly Kaminsky, you've already submitted something to Kaggle, haven't you? Yes, I have. Okay, well, we're going to find out how Kimberly did in a minute. Okay, compete as myself or as a team. You're going to compete as yourself. 
So, well, this thing's taking, this thing's slower than Christmas today, isn't it? The problem with doing this, these sync sessions, is it's kind of like being a fighter pilot. You know, because these fighter pilots, they say that if you, like, are a fighter pilot, they say it's like hours of boredom and moments of terror. Just the opposite. Here I have hours of terror and moments of boredom, okay? So, and if you listen to old sync sessions, you're going to hear that joke again. Um, so, okay, click or drop your submission here. So this is what it's going to look like. You are going to, there's a data set that's like a test data set. And it doesn't have any predictions as to how many wins a team is going to have. So, you know, here, team, this guy here, team number nine, I predict that he's going to have 162 wins. And team 10 is going to have 162. And team 47 is going to have zero wins. So this is the worst possible model. So I predict zero or I predict either you don't win any games or you win lots of games. So this is a bad model. So if I submit this guy, click on this, and that's my worst possible model. Wait a minute, this is, is this in the baseball data set? Let me see, one minute. No, this is insurance. Give me one second. I'm on the desktop is where I want to be. Okay, so we're going to go over here and we're going to grab this guy right here. And this is a bad model, okay? So we're going to click on that and I'm going to say this is a really bad model. Okay, so then I'm going to submit this thing. Bam. And there it is. So my model scored a 90.9, .9, which is the same as, so you're going to be competing against a benchmark, okay? The best possible model has no error at all, okay? Here's my model, whoops, has 11.9, which means that every time I make a prediction, I'm off by 11.9 wins. Raymond, one of our TAs, got a 12.4. Um, the baseline model is we assume everybody wins 82 games because there's a 162-game season, so everybody wins 81 games, which is the, an average. So you got to beat at least the average model, okay? But unfortunately, your score right here is only on about 5% of the data. When I grade you, I'm going to open it up to all 100%, and your position is going to move drastically from where it is right now. So Kimberly here has a score of 15.14. Now, that maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but she won't know until I grade, until I open it up for everybody. What I would recommend you do, and I'm going to tell you this happens every quarter, you fall in love with the leaderboard. That's not what you want to do. You want to build a simple model that makes sense. If your model makes sense and it's doing okay, it's probably a good model. Stop there. If you chase this thing and you keep trying to shave, you know, decimal, you know, act, you know, error off of like the fourth decimal place in, you are going to overfit your model and you're going to get a bad model. And I'm going to give you a very good example of that right now. So I'm going to go over here to one of my models from before. So this is an example. So this is from about, uh, I think this was last Christmas when I taught this class. Okay. Now you're going to notice something here. This is, this is what how the students did on 5% of the data. 
then we wait a little bit here and we wait okay so here we go so you can see that this guy here jrpc on five percent of the data he's got an 11.36 and he's just beating the heck out of everybody right but you'll notice he's got 52 entries and his model was really, really complicated because he kept making all sorts of strange things in his model because he kept wanting to shave off errors for this thing. Now, coming down here, I've got another student, and her name was Kimberly Holmes. Where is Kim Holmes? Um, Kimberly Holmes, there she is. She did six submissions. Now, her score was 13, which means that every time she predicted a team, she was off by 13 wins, whereas this guy was off by 11. So there's only really two wins difference between them two. So it's not even that big of a difference. But Kimberly Holmes only did six submissions. And her model was very simple. It made perfect logical sense. And she kept saying, Don, what's going on? I'm not. I, I'm doing exactly what you said. And look at this. I'm. I'm down here in 34th place. And I said, Well, first of all, Kim, look at the difference between you and this guy. It's two wins. It's not that big a difference. That's nothing in the scheme of life. Don't look at your rank. Look at the difference here. And I said, Second of all, Kim, you've got. You're really far ahead of the benchmark, which is everybody wins 81 games, you know? So that's 18 and you're way up here at 13. So you're doing fine. You're beating the average and that's all you want to do. But this guy up here, he tortured his model and got 11 wins. Now let's see what happens when I open it up to all the data, the private. Now let's see what happens now. So remember, Kim was down there in 34th place but she did good technique, simple models that make sense. Look where she's at now. She jumped up to fourth place when she saw all the data. But what about the other guy? That other guy, he dropped way, way, way down here to 30th place, okay? So the point is, if you torture your data, this is like one of those old World War II movies, you know, in black and white, when the German guy would come out and he's got a monocle and he's got like that riding crop and he goes, we have ways of making you talk. And then, you know, if you torture data, it will tell you what you, it will tell you anything to make you stop torturing it. Don't torture the data. Just love on the data and just fix your missing values Get rid of your outliers, put it in your model, do a stepwise selection. It's as easy as falling in love. That's good technique. So that's what an analytic street brawler will do. So just wanted to give you this as a lesson. Um, does anybody have any questions now? Let's let's go out. I've chatted, I've talked here now for almost a full hour, and I want to make sure that we have uh, any questions, comments, thoughts. So just so I'm clear, we can do the model, submit it, see how we fall, and then go back and tweak it if we don't necessarily like it? That is correct. And if you have lots of models, that uh, uh, Kaggle will default to choose the model that is best on um, – it will choose the model that is best on the 5% that I, that I display. You can go in there and select a different model. So you can, you know, he'll, you know, Kegel has a big list of every model you have. That's why you want to write a little description of each one. If there's one that you're saying, this is a very simple model, blah, 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 and it makes sense, and it comes, you know, and it's not your best model, but you say, yeah, I'm going to go with the simple one, then, um, you can choose whichever one you want, but you only get to choose one model to score at the very end. You can you can uh, submit as many as 20 models a day. I don't recommend doing that. I think that the students who submit 
50, 60, 70 models invariably overfit their model and get a bad score. Do good technique. That's what you want to do. And good technique, fix your missing values. I usually fix them with an, with a, with an average value. That's fine. Decision trees are great. Cap your outliers. Dump your stuff into, into um, stepwise, forward or backwards, and then you're done. And that will get you a good model. How did you generate the Excel to submit that based on the results? Okay, what you will do when you submit this is you're going to, what you'll do is watch the sync sessions that I have, okay? Because what you're just, what you'll do is you'll just do a proc print and SAS, and you'll just print your entire um, data set, just copy it and paste it into Excel. That's what you're going to do. I do it in some of the sync sessions. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little long-winded, Katie. I'm sorry. <laughs> I noticed that halfway through my explanation, students are like, okay, shut up, Don. So have I got everybody scared at this point? Oh, did you come up with the Sprint's reliability as if within 1% of Verizon? No, that was before I joined Sprint. So talk about the quizzes and their due dates. Oh, all quizzes are due on the last day of the class. Oh, 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 thanks for reminding me. Let me show you something. If you're falling asleep, wake up. I'm about to show you something very important. Um, just a minute. Okay. When you get to the quarter, each quarter, or each uh, unit, like unit one here. I have some notes. Now, here's textbook reading one to three. You know, it's it's. I think it's worth reading this stuff. But like I said, some students don't read it, and they just it, every quiz is multiple choice or true and false. Okay, so if nothing else, don't leave any quizzes undone at the end of the quarter because heck, you can guess. It's just Points is what you're going to go. You get by points. Not, not It's not your percentages. It's the points you accumulate. Okay. But these three things, I got notes. And the notes are pretty good. Students like these. So you click on this guy. And I've got PowerPoints. So I've got PowerPoints and SAS code that goes with it. So if you click on this guy, and I'm not a big fan of complicated, crazy PowerPoints. I like to make it step-by-step -step, uh, PowerPoints here. So I walk you through a lot of this stuff. So what's linear regression? Okay, this is about as formulaic as you're ever going to get. I try not to do that to students. But instead, I give you an example. I go, okay, here's Y and here's X6 and X8. And I'm going to use these two guys to predict it. And I say, here's, here's how it gets read in in SAS. And then I, this is how you can do it with PROC regression, PROC GLM, and PROC GenMod. All of these guys will run a, a regression for you. I explain, this is the output. Then I talk about what each of the things mean so you can understand what's coming out of there. Um, you know, I, I just try to, you know, I try to walk you through step by step on these things. And each of these things, after you read through it, look, there's only 18 slides, okay? Um, but then there's a quiz. I recommend, if you read this thing, take the quiz quickly because it's, it's fresh in your mind. Do not get bent out of shape on these quizzes. If you miss a few points, don't worry about it. I've got, it's 250 points of quizzes, but in reality, I got over 300 points out there. So you can miss stuff and you're still going to, if you just do the, the, you know, 
a reasonable amount of reading and stuff, you're going to get your points. Okay, I want you to learn this material, but these things are worth having. And a lot of students don't even, you know, halfway through the quarter, they're like, what are you talking about the PowerPoints? Right here is what I'm talking about. Every, every unit's got these PowerPoints and they're worth looking at. So there I have the code, the SAS code and the PowerPoint. How do you deploy a model? Um, I don't know what else. So yeah, that was important. So any anyway, that was I forgot to talk about that. But any other questions here? But are the quizzes timed? Yes, the quizzes are timed. And Katie, don't say I'm sorry if I addressed it. Ask it again and never worry. Okay, I didn't address it, and that's a great question. Um, so never fear about asking a question. Um, but the quizzes are timed. I usually give you about two minutes a question. And the reason why I do that is if I don't, you're 99% of the students are going to sit down without ever having looked at the notes, and they're going to read the question, and then they're going to go searching around on Google or in the notes to see if they can find the answer. They're going to get it, and then they're going to move on. And I want you to at least have had some sort of understanding of what you've read. If you're going to want, if the first time you look at that material is when you open up the quiz, it's, I promise you, I've set a lot of traps for you. So try to understand the material before you take that quiz. I try not to play gotcha with students, except for with the quizzes. And the only people who get, who fall in the pitfalls are the students who've never looked at the material prior to opening that quiz. So anybody else got questions? I'm hearing stunned silence. Have I successfully terrorized you all or, or are you excited? Terrorized. Terrorized. Read the messages in the bottle from your former students. They will all, they everybody was sitting in your sweaty shoes right now thinking oh my gosh this is going to be a nightmare and they all like the class okay i remember reading that there was a quiz you suggested we take by the end of today but now i can't find where i read that Did I'm... oh no no i i what i suggested was um that students if you had any spare time, you should take the quizzes for unit one beforehand. That's what I said. I mean, the, the unit one quizzes. So you don't have to do that. I mean, I've had students who basically wait to the last day of class and do their quizzes. So in other words, I was saying basically this. Um, come down here to unit one. And you get all these quizzes. So this is the quizzes from chapter one, quiz from chapter two, quiz from my notes from unit one, notes from unit two on missing values. This is pretty good. I mean, I'm giving you real world stuff, okay? This book doesn't talk about how to handle missing values, but I do. I mean, I'm giving you this is how to handle a missing value because in the real world, the data is messy, ugly stuff, okay? It fights back. It doesn't, it doesn't fall out of the sky blessed by the fairy princess. It's ugly stuff, and it's going to have missing values. What do you do with that? So I'm giving you a great big ugly data set, and it's going to fight back, and I'm saying this is what you can do. These are some good techniques to use. So when I told you guys use good techniques, this is what I'm talking about. And so I was hoping you would read this stuff before the class started because, you know, you had some spare time. And then you'll say, oh, gosh, I know how to handle missing values. Oh, my gosh, I've got an outlier here. You know, this, this guy says that this team hit 11 million home runs. That's a lot of home runs. What do I do? So these are the kind of things that you're going to want to, you know, take a quick look at. And I made these things short and sweet. You could probably go through them in a night. But if you don't, like I said, it's not going to be fatal. Um, I would, this adjusted R squared guy right here, everybody says this is a life-changing um, bonus problem. 
It's, it's easy. It's worth 10 quick points, and it will change your life. All of these are actually pretty simple stuff. And in fact, if you look on some of these linear regression um, notes and then try to do the calculations, you're going to find that, that some of them are actually worked out with different numbers. So you're going to learn some stuff here. You can apply it to the homework assignment. And also, you can you can rack up you know rack up some bonus points here. And the other thing is, every single quarter I say this: don't wait till the last minute. Start your homework now. Just do build a little bit of the model, write it as you go, work on it as you you know. Three weeks, little at a time, little at a time. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That's what you do with this stuff. When you start this thing, like. Friday the night before the weekend before it's due, it's going to be a long weekend and you're going to be miserable and you're going to hate yourself. Trust me on this. But read the messages on the bottle. Now, you know, you don't have to read them all, but they're they're worth having. Any other questions, folks? Please talk us through the Kegel submission. I don't understand the CSV file as our prediction. Did you provide the regression? Yes. Okay. So here's what you do, Roger. What you do is we're going to get this. Let me see. Um, just a minute. Let me try to find it. Um, Okay, Moneyball. So here's how it works. You're going to get data sets. I have SAS and I also have CSV. Okay, so I'm going to give you a Moneyball, and this is going to be baseball teams. Okay, so Team number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Notice there's no nine. Notice there's no 10, okay? Nine and 10 aren't there. 11, 12, 13, no 14. Remember, no 14. Okay, so team number one, those guys won 39 games. They got 1,445 hits, blah, 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 okay? So look, the team base run, the, the, the stolen bases, missing. Caught stealing, missing. Hit by pitch, missing, okay? So this is team number one. He won 39 games, and these are the statistics. So you're going to build a predictive model with this using SAS. Then you're going to write some scoring code for it, and I walk you through in the notes how to write scoring code because in the real world, you got to write a scoring program to score new data. Okay, now that you got a predictive model, and watch the videos that I have, okay, we've got a test data set. Now remember that we didn't have team 9 and 10 and 14. Why? Because they're over here in the test file. So team 9, I know they're batting how many hits and how many home runs and everything, but I don't know how many games they've won. But I'm going to use the model that I build to predict that. Now, Don Wedding knows how many teams team 9-1. I know the answer. You don't. You're going to use this information, and you're going to tell me how many wins you think this guy got. And then you're going to submit that to Kegel. Kegel knows the answers too. And he's going to tell you how you did on a very small section, like maybe 20 or 30 of these. And he'll say, well, this is how you did on 20 or 30 of them. But you notice I've got 260 of them. So that's what you're going to be graded on. But he'll tell you how you did on maybe 10, 20 of them, just to, just to give you an idea. But you're going to take this guy and these formulas, and you're going to score them, and what you're going to submit is, so I have a perfect model with the answers, but I'm not going to click on this because you'll see what the answers are. 
mean this is what I everybody wins 81 games. We assume everybody wins 81 games. So you say, I think team nine wins 81, team 10 wins 80, everybody wins 81. That's the average. Your model should better be better than this. This is random. I just generated a random number between zero and 162. So these are all random numbers. Your model better be better than this. And here's the worst model is I just randomly chose between zero and 162. I just chose one of those two, uh, an extreme value on either end. So this is, this is just a model based on one of these two randomly selected. So that's a bad model. So that's what you're going to hand in. Only yours is going to be a a real value real it's going to have a real prediction in it and you're going to submit it to kegel does that answer your question robert or did i not help you okay is there a difference between moneyball test files and moneyball test random moneyball test random is simply the test values with a random number attached so you see what it's supposed to look like so that's all it is. Moneyball test random is only there so that you know what you what what it's supposed to look like. If you're missing any values, it's not gonna uh Kegel doesn't like it. Does anybody else got any questions? Okay. So let me ask you guys a quick question. When can you call me? When are you allowed to call me? Just type it in the tax window. And that's right, Joey's got it. Anytime. Do I do I hope that you don't call me at 3 a.m. on a Sunday? <laughs> yes. But if you think it's an emergency, should you call? Yes, very good. Yep. And how many stupid questions have I ever gotten teaching this class? That's right. Okay, you guys got it. Now, who's the best looking instructor teaching 411 who lives in Cleveland, Ohio? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Francisco's got the right answer. So there you go. Guys, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to stop I'm going to stop recording. Bam.